<clears throat> hey everybody, welcome to the Nexus Ag Update. We got Chad here. Howdy. How are you doing, Chad? Very good. Good. We got good. some rain. Oh yeah. I was looking. Did you have a gauge out? Uh, I did not, but I know our guest does have oh, a gauge out. Perry, why don't you uh, introduce yourself? Uh, I don't think you've been on the podcast before. Long time listener, first time uh, caller kind of a thing? Yes. Uh, long time, first time. <laughs> <Atta> boy. Um, <laughs> I've got a history with you guys. Nothing good. Um, as long as I'm, it's not a beef. <laughs> yeah, we can get through that. I'm Perry Weigel. I'm the seed care specialist for Syngenta for the state of Minnesota. And uh, I uh, work with uh, the Nexus crew and sometimes not willingly, but, you know, it's, <laughs> it's always uh, willingly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's not like we don't have a history or yeah, something. Yeah, it's nothing like a uh, very, very, very long history. So what did you do uh, before you worked for Syngenta? Yeah, I was a longtime Winfield seed rep, and you guys were arguably one of my better accounts. And, you know, maybe it was just the amount of time that I, an effort that I put into you guys that... Uh, we require a lot of hand-holding, I think. Drug you kicking and was. screaming <laughs> yeah. into, uh, you know, into this realm. But and, and to be fair, we didn't pay him a dime to say that to us. <laughs> so that's, that's, I appreciate that. Yeah. And you could tell by the bantering that, uh, you know, that we go way back, but, uh, yeah, I did have a rain gauge out and I think it, it, I didn't check it up close, but it, with my bad old eyes, it looked like we had about an inch total. I was about to say, was it over one or under one? Cause yeah, I was, was right just, at. I was just right at one. And it was yeah. raining again this morning I, on my way here. Yeah. Um, it was raining pretty good. Actually, in your area, once I got past yeah. 218 South, then it was raining really good. Yeah, and then we had, and that's, I put it up after the snow, so we probably had a tenth or two on top of that with uh, moisture from the snow. Yeah, and that's, that's pretty local, too, because it's just over by the Osage area, so I'd say that's probably about what we right saw in for, heart. right in the heart of the right territory. Right in the heart of Nexus. Yeah. So we brought Perry in because we're getting kind of close to um, making some decisions on the seed treatment side and getting ready to start planting here. And uh, one thing Brady and I, we were doing yesterday, we we did get help get the uh, seed treater going up in Adams. And I know uh, or Stacyville. They got, or, or Stacyville, I'm sorry, uh, in, in Stacyville. And, and I think Randalia was running uh, the other day too. So we're yep. starting to kind of make those uh, start working on that stuff internally. And that'd be a good time to have that conversation about why we do seed treatments. So we brought in the expert. So this is where you want me to start. Well, I mean, part <laughs> of it, <laughs> I mean, the biggest question is why do we treat seed? Yeah. Well, let's, let's dive into that. Uh, so the obvious thing is, is that we have early season disease and insect pressure. Uh, that that's, that's the one that's fairly obvious to everybody. Um, but historically speaking, you know, you can go back in time and universities would tell you that the best way to dodge early season diseases is to plant your soybeans later. Well, we found that from a yield perspective, the best way to gain yield on soybeans is early planting. So the best way to mitigate those diseases uh, through early planting is to use a seed treatment. And, you know, basically what we're after or what we're encouraging guys to do is to really take a look at, a, at your entire disease spectrum in that early season uh, planting window that you're, that you're doing or that you're going to plant in and know the disease spectrum that that you're dealing with in your local area. Well, I can tell you that the one that sticks out uh, in my mind and having dealt with it pretty intimately is Pythium. Um, from Highway 20 in Iowa, for sure Highway 3 to basically the Canadian border, Pythium is our disease. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, we've had historically uh, Pythium that's bad enough in the local area, in these local areas that it will smoke corn. So basically, you know, when we look at, you know, metal axle based chemistries and metal axle is one of those products that's a first generation Pythium product that's been around since late seventies, early eighties, you know, uh, Mephinoxum, that's an isomer of metal axle has been around since 1981. So I'm, I'm going to say like for sure, 1980. 
Um, so we're talking about a chassis that's probably 40 years old or more. Yeah, yeah for sure. Old. And when we, and it's still a, it's still a really good chemistry. It still has really good activity on some of these pythium species. But what we find is that the new products like, in our case, PCBX or Piker Butrazox that we have in Cruiser Max Apex um, is three, four decimal points more active on these Pythium species than than what uh, metal axle is or even mefenoxin that you've, we have. You've pronounced that once or twice, I assume? A couple of times. <laughs> and uh, I just use so, the PCBX. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, not yeah. Even gonna... that's PCBX is the best way. That's We call it PCBX on soybeans and Viantis on corn. Um, but, um, you know, the rates are a little bit different. But obviously, so, you know, there's knowing that early season disease spectrum. Um, the, the other piece of it is that I look at our uh, demographic that we have up in Northern Iowa, Southern Minnesota. And that is the progressiveness of our growers is really high. So we've got a lot of guys that are planting early. We've got guys that are planting ahead of corn. In some cases, we have guys that have dedicated soybean planters, um, which all is real conducive to early planting on soybeans. Well, you, so, bring, you bring that up and it's like for soybeans, it's not, heat like corn right it's sunlight and you got to get to a date and how do you photo period based and how do you do that plant early plant early yep and you know there's the other thing is like the last few years we talk a lot on the corn about inhibitional chilling if you go out there too early and guys are looking for ways to kind of spread their risk you know well i want to get going early but i don't want to burn my corn and screw that up Let's go out there with the beans. They're a little bit yeah. more forgiving on that versus the corn is. And if we lose some stand on soybeans, it's not the worst thing in the world. But no. what we're trying to do with. And we uh, found that out last year. I yeah. mean, you could you go out there with 150 and maybe what would we what was our kind of cutoff? 90? 90. And we still you had a decent stand out there. Well, in our test plot in Adams, we've done that six eight years now and and our lowest population wins it every year yeah about every, uh, maybe once or twice but like 75 won it two years ago and i think it was second or third it's like that's right. well below what we consider an industry standard for min- yeah. minimum yeah. and i and i do think that guys are starting to cut back on soybean populations a little bit um you know guys have historically gone from you know 180, 160. Well, you know, north of 180 in some cases, if a guy's no tilling, there's, I've heard it as high as 220. And right now, you know, 140 is kind of the industry standard. And we're seeing guys go less than that. So every bean counts. And so when we're treating, when we're treating soybeans, especially with Cruiser Max Apex as our base fungicide and insecticide, um, what we're after is that really good, consistent, uniform germination, emergence, and early vigor. And Cruiser Max Apex brand uh, seed treatment from Syngenta offers that. So <laughs> there's I the just, plug. There there's it is. Plug. I love there it. it is. So, and, you know, you mentioned uh, planting early, you know, as, you know, a way to get those beans up and out of the ground. It seems like, you know, when I was in college and you guys too, um, they always said, yeah, you know, planting corn early, you know, that corn takes that, that cold weather a lot better. I don't know. I, I, it seems like soybeans, um, at least up until, uh, you know, up to the first trifoliate, it seems like it handles cold weather as good as anything. And once you get to that trifoliate though, man, a a frost is going to smoke them. But, but, uh, as we saw a couple of years ago, you know, that Father's Day freeze. But um, I think the big thing is, is that early, you know, early on, at least when those uh, pre-emerge type situations, it seems like they, you, they're they a little less responsive to that inhibitional chilling and, and maybe uh, they have a little bit from a vigor standpoint, they're just maybe a tick bit more vigorous. Well, I, I think they're less punitive. You know, if you lose... A couple stand or on corn, you know, let's say you lose four or five percent, you're going to ding yourself 10 or 15 percent on the final yield or beans. 
you know, you don't have that. And, you know, where sometimes like beans will find a way to catch up a little bit or, or, yeah. or extend a hand if you want to say that. Well, and I know that one of the components of uh, Cruiser Max Apex is is Cruiser. Yeah, um, and that helps with the vigor. Thiamethoxam, it's a neonictin uh, chemistry that it kind of helps, uh, you know, that little nicotine-based product. It helps kind of turbocharge that early season growth, yeah. which, you know, the the emergence, um, you know, is a, is a tick better. It's uh, the the uh, early vigor is a tick better. Um, Seems like it's a day or two faster out of the ground. Potentially, it's. Uh, I know that uh, we're a couple of days faster to canopy by using that product as well. So it's, you know, it, and we haven't even touched on the the uh, the value of earlier canopy where weed control is concerned either. So it's that's something that uh, is kind of an added bonus to uh, you know the seed care side of things as well. So let's let's kind of elaborate on that a little bit more. Um, let's page to the next. What do you got in the next? So let's go through kind of why we, you know, some with the seed treatment side of things. Sometimes we always worry about when it's cold and wet when it comes to diseases, and obviously the big one for that is pythium. But sometimes we do get into a trap of, um, well, if it's warm or dry, I don't need to worry about my seed treatment. Uh, is that truthful or is that just hopefulness? I think that that is, uh, you know, that's hope. Because if you look at the disease spectrum, there's four main diseases. And we're going to throw SDS in on, on top of that. So for a fifth. And um, so our base fungicide and insecticide is going to cover Pythium, Phytophthora, Fusarium, and Rhizoc. And all four of those diseases have a little bit different moisture and temperature spectrum. So if we look at, you know, whether it's cold and wet versus warm and dry, uh, Cruiser Max Apex has you covered it with all those spectrums, you know. So cooler and damper is is the uh, conditions. Those are the conditions that favor Pythium and Fusarium virgiliforme, which is the pathogen that causes SDS. And that's pretty much our default position in our yes. area. And if you look at the limiting factors that we have every single spring in southern Minnesota and northern Iowa, uh, from a weather standpoint, it is some form of too cool and some form of too moist. And every it's probably 19 years out of 20 that we that we experience that. We're probably in year 20 this year, or at yeah. least the start well, of it was. I was about to say, yeah. you can go to the other side of this chart here. Yes. Um, I think Rhizoc is a big big deal it's and especially it's becoming last bigger. year last year and i think uh well depending on what this year brings pretty sure it's going to be a big deal again yeah. this year um i even saw some in some corn uh last oh, year oh yeah it yeah. was yeah. It, we tested it and everything couldn't figure out what it was and it came back with rhizoc yeah and and you know we look at epithium being our big disease down here you know and and if you look at where we find pythium it's it's kind of between those tile lines those weepy side hills, those low spots, anywhere water sits. Whereas Rhizoc and Fusarium are a little bit, they're on the drier spectrum. Yep, you know, the Fusarium likes those cool, dry conditions. Uh, Rhizoc favors those warmer, drier conditions and more stress. Well, if you think back to what we had last spring, it was a little bit more stress. Some herbicide carryover in spots, you know, any kind of compaction, any kind of stressor is going to drive that drive that disease oh we were sitting some of these beans were sitting in dry dirt at the end too yeah correct yeah and then how long were they sitting there it felt like a month well it's at and least then two all to the, three weeks and then all of a sudden they're up within the first little bit of moisture they got i even had some corn in that same scenario i had a, a guy that you know planted corn after some rye and and that stuff sat in the ground for two and a half weeks before we finally got moisture yeah it was crazy yeah and I think too that you know we touched on SDS. Um, you know that that pathogen favor it favors those cooler, damper conditions. But you know if I didn't know any better, I'd swear that we see a little bit of SDS infection. You know based on cyst nematode pressure. Yep. Um, the higher the cyst count, you know it seems like you know those there's such a synergy between those two pathogens that 
you know, you can see some infection with, uh, you know, SDS through the, the cyst, uh, the cyst that we see, you know, the amount of cyst pressure that we see across the area. Do you think the cyst numbers are going up this year, Chad? Probably. From what will. we've seen. I mean, we test every year well, just at random too. Yeah, we do. I mean, one of the, one of the key factors on that is most of our, most of our soybeans are, you know, got the eight eight seven eight eight seven gene to kind of help with that. Yeah, eighty eight seven eighty eight. Or okay, I'm yeah. dyslexic <laughs> this morning or something, but but yeah, which makes Peking a lot easier to say. I mean, that seems like that's the buzzword here the last two two winters. You know, you're seeing a lot of uh, companies going to Peking. I mean, yeah, you know, I mean, we're starting to see some situations where we're going to have to start controlling the cyst as well, and if that helps with the sudden death. I mean, that's that's a that's a scenario that we got to kind of be ready for. It's a it's a double whammy. Uh, you know, the cyst nematode pressure um, basically anywhere in the soybean growing areas of the United States. If you feel like you don't have cyst pressure, go over two feet and take that and take that test because if you look at the inconsistency of the distribution of cyst nematode on that acre, it's wildly inconsistent. You know, there's uh, Dr. Tilka at Iowa State has done a study where he takes a third of an acre, breaks it up into 10 by 20 foot blocks, and they test that. Um, you know, they do 10 cores and then 100 cc's of soil in each one of those blocks. And basically, you can go from zero on the low end to north of 35,000 on the high end uh, from an egg count standpoint. So, you know, how you test is more cores is better than less you know when it comes to cyst nematode testing well and that's that's something that dave's been kind of touting a lot is we need to do more cyst testing that also kind of plays into a little bit of that trace genomics conversation too where you know we're trying to test for dna for for some of those things i i guess my my opinion is if if you got to test that or if you're curious i would test period yeah. i mean In it, it might cost a little bit to do, but at the end of the day, it's probably going to be money well spent. And I'm guessing, too, that if you feel that you don't have cyst nematode pressure on your soybean acres, um, denial is that river in Egypt. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's there. And the best way to get rid of cyst nematode uh, pressure, well, to lessen your uh, risk of cyst nematode is... For sure, when you're using soybeans, is to use a quality, you know, or is to use Saltro uh, brand SDS and SCN uh, treatment from Syngenta, and it's uh, Saltro does exactly what it's it's meant to do, and that is it really, um, it really takes care of. It does a nice job on those first generation cysts and subsequent generations after that. It it helps to lower that those uh, subsequent generations because it 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 does such a good job in that first generation and from a fusarium virgiliforme standpoint it's an sdhi chemistry so basically it kills cyst nematode and that uh, fusarium pathogen in the same way and so it's a it's a respiration inhibitor and it basically takes away that respiration of those uh of those two pathogens. Yeah. I mean, I'll tell a guy when they ask the question about Saltro, you better make sure that you have something added to it because it's not going to do anything to as, as much as a broad spectrum fungicide, like, like cruiser max or vibrance. Well, and plus it's uncolored. So we have to put something colored with it yeah. anyway. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of like your, your add on product. Yeah. It's, yeah. Um, it's a bolt on product. It's a bolt on. Yeah. And it's your package product. Yeah. And it does, like I said, it does exactly what it's supposed to do. You know, two years ago, we had a fair amount of uh, SDS pressure across northern Iowa, southern Minnesota. And um, it seems like along that I-90 corridor uh, north to probably just south of the cities and uh, that whole corridor uh, had fairly significant SDS pressure two years ago. So we're rotating back into those same fields this next spring. Yep. Or this this spring. And so growers are gonna have to decide what they're gonna do because the, you know, from that 
from that standpoint, the, the inoculum is there. And so when you talk about overwintering of disease, you know, and, or, or I'm sorry, overwintering of insects and the amount of pathogen inoculum that's in these soils, it's, it's extensive. And, uh, you know, one of the things that we're, that we're concerned with, obviously, going into the spring is making sure that that SDS pathogen is taken care of with, because we did see it was a yield limiting event two years ago for the guys that had it. So if, you know, there were plots out there that where they had treated and untreated beans in the plots and, and some of those guys experienced a fair, a fairly substantial yield loss to the tune of seven to eight, nine bushels, 10 bushels in some cases. So. Well, and just to add on to last year, uh, anything that was treated was hundred percent covered. Yeah. Well, I mean, we, we, we were in an area that had a lot of replant. It seemed like anybody who was before that certain. There was like the March, Mar- Mar- May 10th. I, we had a, like a really heavy rain event in, in our area and. Crusting. A lot of crusting, a lot of crusting. And, uh, one, one thing I think made decisions really easy for guys that had a seed treatment. It's like, oh, Hey, by the way, it's hundred percent replant. Oh, well, good thing I did yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. the seed company will take care of the seed side of it, and we'll take care of the the seed treatment side of yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, and and at that point, that that a lot made sure those guys that did that they actually seed treated the replant too. Yeah, and the beauty of that is, you know, with Cruiser, um, depending on when it's planted, you know, so when you, earlier you talked about later planting or warmer condition planting, you know, and the and not really needing. Uh, seed treatment quote unquote quote unquote well the the way to throw cold water on that is is to understand what all seed treatments actually cover so once you're once you're into uh you know the disease spectrum changes with soil temperature so as we warm up that that uh, disease spectrum changes so you get to about call it 60 65 degrees and we start to see more phytophthora as opposed to pythium. So when we go from cool, wet to warm, wet, it doesn't mean that the pythium is going away. It just means that we're going to start seeing a little bit more phytophthora on top of that as that soil temperature warms up. So um, anytime that those soil temperatures do warm, you know, we just have a, a disease a species shift. And, you know, we see a little bit more insect pressure as those, as those soil temperatures warm up. So the overwintering, one of the concerns this this year has been, you know, the lack of winter to kill those overwintering uh, insect populations. And which which insects are you worried about in that scenario, Perry? I would say that uh, this year, you know, it's the one that really sticks out is bean leaf beetle. And um, we haven't really in southern Minnesota and southeast Minnesota haven't had a, a super severe um uh, bean leaf beetle outbreak in quite some time, but where they have them, it's, it's very concerning to the, to the growers in those areas. And I, a winter like this last one that we experienced where we had super mild conditions and lack of snow cover, lack of, uh, really, you know, we had a couple of weeks of cold weather, but that was about it. I got a customer that made a comment to me the other day. He's got a cousin that lives in Illinois. And he said, this feels like an Illinois winter around here this year. Yeah. You know, or you, like you just described, I mean, it, it was kind of cold for a few days, but mainly mild the rest of the summer. And we all know what they deal with on a day-to-day basis, especially in early season when it comes to disease and, and bugs like that. Well, real early in my career, I spent a couple of years in Kansas, Northeast Kansas, and uh, the the disease spectrum the, and insect spectrum that they see down there is completely different than what we see up here. And because of that lack of winter, you know, their insect populations are a lot higher. That's why I like farming in this part of the world. <laughs> Honestly, I know people. Chad chose this place. Uh, well, no, but I mean, I, I look at, um, you know, this area when it comes to being able to kill things off 
we don't have like all these annual winter annuals and perennials when it comes to the weed <laughs> weed side of things we don't have these weird diseases that just never die i mean we get it our, our ground and our, our environment gets a little bit of a break in between you know the diseases that we do have are sig significant enough i wouldn't wish them really on anybody else but we but got management but or we, ways to manage it though we've got really excellent management tools and i think that based on all this you know when you look at the diseases that we're up against man you know, we have tailor-made solutions for those. Yeah. Otherwise, the other option is go spray four times a year, five times a year. And, and that's not cheap either. Yeah. So the from a seed care standpoint with within Syngenta, our are the products that we're that we're dealing with are just best in class across the board, you know, whether it's cruiser, whether it's vibrance, whether it's uh, PCBX, you know, it's just a really really high-end chemistry so let's go into that uh on the uh cruiser max apex a little bit what makes that unique versus um maybe some other products on the market when you know obviously there's a lot of companies that have fungicide insecticide mixes why is this uh the product that we should be focusing on well for starters it's an engineered premix, and it stay you know from the in it this may not necessarily matter to the guy that's planning it, but, but it matters to the guy treating it though. It matters you're talking to, the guy to a couple it. guys that have yeah. done a lot of treating it. This guy right here. When you look at uh, the, the treating um, the lack of treating issues. Um, it's I've my talked, favorite product. to yeah, treat with. I, 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 I sent you a video yesterday yeah, I, yeah. that I took. Yep. I love treating with apex. I hands down my favorite product to treat yeah. with. Cruiser Max Apex is, it is a tremendous. Vibrance Trio is not too far. It's a little bit further behind, but that treats as well. Pretty it's just good a too. step it's down on the brand ladder. Correct. Yeah. correct. And, and, and it, while we're talking about Vibrance Trio, we'll just touch on that. It's missing two really key components uh, that Cruiser Max Apex has got. It's missing, obviously, the Apron, or the Apron XL that is, or I'm sorry, the, I'm sorry back up a second it's missing the pcbx from a pythium phytophthora yep. standpoint and it's got a 4x rate of apron xl in it and it's also missing the the cruiser piece the insecticide piece and you know those are two really big components that uh cruiser max apex has got it that uh, vibrance trio doesn't along with a little bit of extra red colorant and um to make those beans really kind of pop oh they're awesome and, and uh the the beauty of syngenta chemistry is it all starts with the formulation side of things our formulation chemists are some of the best in the industry and where cruiser max apex is concerned there's 21 components to it and the the keg when you take it off the truck when you go to treat it and say you take it off the truck in december and you treat it in in march or april um the ability to that of that stuff to stay in suspension is unlike any other chemistry so I'll, out there I'll, I'll jump on here with you um so like you said it always said you know always every keg no matter what keg you do get always says recirculate right um recirculate or not it always comes out looking the same as it does if you i mean just carrying it over and there's products in the past where we've mixed recirculate for a half hour whatever we need to do and it still is just taking down a rock road yeah it's still just you know inconsistent um you know we've actually come to the point where and you were you were around when we did this when we like literally kicked it down the shed yeah. to mix it up because it just it was stuck on the crab was stuck on the bottom but you can over mix some of those products too yeah, where i mean your product seems like we don't have that sheer problem yeah yeah kind of like um so i know you mentioned we, it about we making about butter it. yeah we talked about it a little <laughs> bit it's almost like that buttering effect if you've got that impeller i hate those impellers they're great idea great concept but some kegs come with those impellers and if you sit in there and you've got a drill that's really kicking you're, you're making cottage cheese instead of instead of actually mixing it the other thing you're doing is creating a lot of bubbles yeah and from a treating experience standpoint it's not going to be the best thing for that. Well, it's not going to flow through the atomizer real well, and you're not going to yeah. get good coverage. I tell yeah. you what, if you want to um, get to know your filters on your treater setup, 
mix yeah. the crap out of it, kick it around, shake it up, get as much bubbles, air, everything you can in it, and then you'll get to know your filters on your <laughs> pumps very well. Not well, not, speaking not, from not experience, the, not the fun way too. <laughs> you yeah. know, the beauty of it too is we want everything to come out of that keg and go onto the seed. And with our product, it all comes out of the keg. There's nothing. There's not. I've a, had zero problems. Yeah, oh, it's no awesome. film left and, in it. Yeah. There's no sludge at the bottom. That's all active ingredient. Yeah. And so, yeah, from a formulation standpoint, uh, our formulation chemists are they're tremendous. Yeah, they know what they're doing. And so, you know, same with uh, Vibris Trio and Saltro as well. The, those formulation chemists, they have it. They yeah, have it zero uh, and and we've used all three of them. Um, never had never had problems. Um, I know there's been sometimes where we even get two and a halfs, and you can see at the bottom of some of these two and a halfs of some other products that you know there's just a fil- film on the bottom of you know quote unquote active sitting down there. Um, yeah, never never uh, had a problem handability wise. I just I can't say enough how much I love working with the product. Well, and it does what it's supposed to do at the treater, and it does what it's supposed to do yeah. going through the planter, in the field. Yeah. And it does what it's supposed to do in the field. I, I just always recommend that guys use a 60 40 top graphite mix to make sure that it flows out of the planter. You know, just that little extra lubrication, yeah. you know, that that's standard with a treated bean. So, well, let's talk a little bit about this PCBX and, uh, why why that's thrown into the mix versus um you know on the vibe versus why why it's not in the vibrance well it's uh we're trying to trying to keep uh the brand ladder those rungs in the brand ladder right. separated right. and um piker butrus ox or pcbx is it is the newest most robust pythium phytophthora latest generation molecule on the market today And it's effective against all those pythium species, you know, that there's literally, I don't know, there's probably well over a hundred, maybe in, you know, uh, certainly of isolates, there's certainly thousands of isolates out there that, uh, uh, but yet at the same time, the mode of action is not similar to anything else on the market, whether it's ethyboxum or a metal axle or anything like that. Uh, those earlier generation products, but uh, PCBX, it also shows no uh, cross resistant, any no mode of action. So the, the, the beauty of PCBX is that if you look at it from the standpoint of effectiveness against Pythium species, um, you know, here's a, here's a graph where we've got our spider chart where we've got 16 Pythium species and you know, we, we call it a spider chart, a radar graph, whatever you want to call it. Yep. But basically you take a liter of water and you start adding, or you add in uh, active ingredient. Well, we started at a thousandth of a gram or a milligram, or I'm, I'm sorry, thousandth of a gram. And we work up to a hundred grams into that, into that liter of water. And, um, you know, so it's, uh, I'm sorry, milligrams. And um, you can see the, the, the difference in activity against those Pythium species and what it actually takes to be active against those Pythium species based on that. Based on that. And in most cases, uh, PCBX is, is three to four decimal points more active on those Pythium species. Yeah, so anybody that's listening, not following us on, on the video, but what it shows is just this big halo with, with all the PCBX at, on the different subsets of, of uh, Pythium. And there's a few of them that are getting really rough to control with current products like Metal Axle that it's offering almost no control at times. And, you know, where this has kind of got a nice halo effect on it. Yeah, I've that. never say resistant, but I would no, sort of but it's, say, it's, it's, certainly it's, say less active. Less active. And, um, you know, when we look at the activity of those, uh, products on those Pythium species, it, it goes back to, you know, driving down the road and scouting at 55 and seeing those dips in the, in the crop canopy in between tile lines, you know, the odds are pretty good that, you know, everybody wants to say, oh, water sat there. Well, what happens when water sits there? You Z sets in. It's a, it's a pythium area within that field. 
And if you know that you're on 70 foot centers or whatever that center is, the odds are pretty good that in the middle of those, of those tile lines, you're going to see some, you're going to see some pythium just because water has a tendency to sit in those areas. Well, it's just like anything. I mean, we, the practice is that may, maybe some products that we've been using for the past 30, 40 years, I, I like atrazine, for example, on the herbicide side, wonderful product when it came out, still use a lot of it. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, we got other control measures that we need to do use because it's not as strong on some pr uh, weeds that it used to be. Yeah, it's, uh, th that's a really great example of that too, you know, and it's, and I think when you look at uh, how well Pythium controls or uh, how hard Pythium is to control for some of the chemistries that are on the market today, uh, up at the Seed Care Institute in Stanton, uh, we always do some experimenting with uh, or, you know, make some demos with where we take a Petri dish with agar in it and you put a plug in it that is inoculated with disease. And you put um, some soybeans in it, whether they're untreated or treated with metal axle or ethyboxum or in this case, PCBX. The cool thing about the PCBX is that in on these agar plates, it's a medium that really is conducive to the growth of that, of that fungal pathogen. Yeah, there's nothing holding it back. There's nothing holding it back. So when you see uh, an untreated bean in there, for the folks that are not treating their beans, um, the, the fungal pathogen will overtake that, that uh, Petri dish just in a matter of hours and maybe a day um, and basically kill those beans. Um, then you get into methyl, metal axle and ethyboxum treated uh, uh, soybeans. And in some species, the metal axle will, will look fairly decent until you hold it up to the light and see that you'll see that mycelial growth or the, that fungal growth out to the, you know, out to the edge of that. Whereas, you know, looking at it at a distance, it looks pretty good. Uh, whereas PCBX, uh, the, the, the value that that thing brings to the table, that molecule is that you get clean, crisp lines in the, and there's no mycelial growth past where those soybeans are. And that active ingredient, uh, really inhibits that growth of that mycelia or that inhibits that mycelial growth of that fungal pathogen. Yeah, it's, it's a cool, cool test. I think, uh, I think I had these slides in our slide deck at yeah. our winter summit last yeah. year. I was going to bring that up. You had, you had them and we kind of yeah. walked through it a little bit and yep. I know you helped and, with that too. Yeah. And we'll, we'll do some of these, uh, live demos and the, and the value of them are, or the value of that live demo is basically holding that, holding at bay, holding that, that dish up to the light and seeing the mycelial growth out to the edge of that dish. So yeah, it, uh, it does exactly what it PCBX is a molecule that does exactly what it's supposed to do. And it really does a really, it's best in class against Pythium and Phytophthora. You want to touch on some of the stuff that we have now or? Um, yeah, I mean, we kind of talked about Saltro and some of those things like that. Um, one thing we did do, we did some upgrades in our facility in Stacyville this, this winter um, to the point where we do, we can treat a lot more products and, than we had before. Yeah, we got a couple more mixed tank, a couple or more mixed, scales, uh, pump scales. Yep. Um, on top of that, we did get uh, uh, something, a Flex Connect system. Yep, for the Preside uh, inoculant. Yep, so. to work with our inoculant. So the biggest problem we were having in the past is once you open it, you kind of are on a you gotta, ticking you time. Time clock, yeah. Uh, this is a closed system. It's a closed system. It's it's sterile, so um, you're not mixing the two products together. What happens a lot of times with your fund or your inoculants, since you you have like an extender uh, product that's yeah, added you to it, have that you oil, get, and then you've got the living organism. Yes, yeah. So what when they send that to us? I mean, they ship it in two separate bags, bladders, tanks, whatever you want to call it. Yep. But then you mix the two together, and then uh, once you start that, though, then the process of of getting them fired up, and then and then the other side of it is if they're fired up, that could cause them to die at times. Great for in season, but uh, not yeah, so great. Not for, so great like for this March right and end of February when we want to get started on our treating. Yeah, because actually the the product we're going to be using is uh, Preside Ultra from 
um, for Dijon. And, yep. and they've done a lot of studies on that where, you know, even in a 24 to 48 hour period in a, in a vat, I mean, we're seeing some, some really decent mortality at that point. So, yeah. The cool part about this is that it's, it, they're, they're still in a bladder. So they're still, um, the chance for it to live and, 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 and coagulate and whatever it yep. needs to do. Um, we have seen some in the past, if it comes in, you know, a keg or a closed, yep. uh, a two and a half, um, the efficacy of the product doesn't seem to be there. Um, so that's one thing I liked about it. The uh, second thing I liked about it is, yeah, it's literally just screw, screw, and then you're done, you know? Well, the, the other reason we went with that one too, or we're, we're moving towards that, um, the, you know, the counts on it are, are about double what, you know, what we see yeah. in other, other setups. And, and then, and then the other part is, um, it's got that tag team in there or, or no, a takeoff, the takeoff technology in there. Yeah. It's well, and, it, and, and that kind of helps with that, um, nitrogen and nutrient assimilation in the, in the ground. So guys, why should it, why should your growers inoculate their soybeans? Well, um, I just actually, that's on the tip of my tongue because I was doing a webinar over the weekend on it. Um, <laughs> oh, nice. a lot of it is, uh, you know, you think about what's in the ground. Uh, most of the, most of the bacteria that we've, we've added that. That was not naturally occurring in the ground. So um, the stuff that we went out there 40, 50, 60 years ago, um, it was made to withstand our weather and our climate and stuff. Maybe it wasn't the most highest fixing bacteria out there. Um, it was made to survive. Um, so at that point, you know, we, we adding these other products that are a little bit more um more efficient. They, they produce more nitrogen. When you think about beans, I mean, you're talking four to five pounds of nitrogen per bushel is a, is the requirement. Well, we're not throwing any 300 pounds of nitrogen no. out there. When's the last time you know somebody put nitrogen on their beans? Oh boy. I mean, we got to do some guys doing some testing at like R1, R2, you know, with some AMS or something like that. But, but then that's not real cost effective either. You know, you think about what that costs per acre to do and, um, but we're getting a lot of it from the nutrient cycling in the ground, from the inocula from the uh, nodulation on the beans. So anything that we can do to push that envelope and and get better infection, get that closer to the root and and you know, get that nodulation in a better place. That's so basically it's part of all those high yield conversations, just the same way the yep. seed treatment yep. is yeah. Part and, of that conversation. And it's, it's what we did is we took the next step with this Bersite Ultra, um, getting the next best thing, um, better for you, better for us. Um, just in, just in general, uh, you know, just like we did with, uh, Vibrance and, and Apex, you know, taking the next step away from some of those metal axle based products and taking that jump up. That's obviously we found that it's a better value for, um, uh, the growers we serve and, because that with the new setup, the way it's set up, we can do up to four, five. Well, we can probably do technically five, but probably not going to do five. But yeah, four we, for sure. We've got yeah, we've got five. We've got five stands. Um, but one of them is going to be kind of your fungicide stand or your fungicide insecticide stand. Yeah. So so we're able, in my opinion, we're able to go a little bit quicker because uh, we're not disconnecting and connecting, uh, recirculating, bleeding out lines. Um, it's just, okay, we go from one line to the next to the next. Everything's all connected. Yep. Um, it's less downtime, um, something I'm really excited about. So, uh, we, awesome. especially firing it up yesterday. It and, was fun. And I was, uh, I was looking at it. I was like, oh, we need to, no, no, we don't, no, we don't need to move it out. Hey, we, real good. quickly, uh, were you taking were you treating bulk beans or were you treating out of a box? Uh, we, we had were, some boxes. Yeah, we were boxed inside. How old was the temperature of those beans? Oh, uh, I don't know. I mean, the shed's fifth, probably about was, 50. They were 50, 55 okay. was about that, the temp. Is that shed heated? Yes. Ooh, awesome. Well, yeah. I mean, it's got like one run in it. I mean, it's just enough to get the but chill out of it. keeping it above freeze. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. So yeah. we've got our bins outside. I know I, I talked with the guy down in Randaly at our, our site down there. And we're kind of on the lower end, kind of towards those lower 40s. I know um, your recommendation is at the lowest we want to be is like upper 40s, 50s. Or well, I'd like to see it above 40 for sure. Yeah. And the, get that sweat out of it. Yeah, get that sweat out of it. And, you know, it's 
coverage is a real tough thing. The colder the beans are, the, the worse the coverage is on, Correct. That, on that product. And the more time you're going to need for it to dry and all well, that crap. Well, that and it just seems like it speckles, you know. Mm -hmm. It, it know, doesn't imbibe inside yeah, that. Yeah, cold bean doesn't imbibe that chemistry as fast as a warm bean does. And so. see, that was our problem with where we were at before, where everything was outside. Yes. And I mean, coverage was tough. You pretty much had to throw the coals at it just to get. As yeah. you know, just to get the water, coverage, a lot, a lot of, water. of witches brews. Yeah. Yep. And so this, you know, being inside now, um, climate controlled environment, especially yesterday when it was raining, um, and cold. was, was awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah. the only thing I had to really worry about was keeping the hands warm as, <laughs> uh, as you go through the warehouse. Yeah. Cause we don't, I mean, she's not 80 degrees in there. No, but, we don't uh, want it to be though. We'll, we'll leave it at, you know, 50, 55. So, well, and, and for us, we got some boxes, we got a treat. We got to start working on that. We'll work on that yeah. stuff first and, yeah. and try well, and clear out the warehouse, clear too. Out the warehouse yeah, a little for what bit. We have inside and get that shipped out. Yeah. So. Cause there was a handful that needed to go to other locations and, you know, we had some stuff going South and West and, you know, it was nice to get that stuff out the door because that's that's you know once we get that out the door then we feel a lot better about things you know for those guys that are that are treating uh soybeans that are the soybeans are in, a, in cold storage uh it's amazing you bring that box into a like in a climate controlled room you pop the lid off that box and you empty the box what's the first thing that happens Oh, no, there's you get a little, film of moisture. Yeah, it's a little sweaty. Builds up, you know, they those beans go through a sweat. There's yep. a, the box will kind of there will be condensation on the inside of that. Yeah. Box so even. The, the perfect uh, way to explain this is I'll go back to when we housed all of our seed and rose crack. <laughs> um, so we had that Butler building filled to the gills, and you'd start. It always be you'd start down the middle because that's was that was the easiest. That was the most uh, frequent stuff you're going to get in and out of there. And you'd get a row out and say, you've got a 50 some degree day, maybe 60 some degree day or outside. 70 or 80. Yeah. And you drive in there and it felt like a cooler in there because yeah. everything was still cold. And then you yeah. looked at the boxes and they were wet. Well, and, the and then the floor was wet. Yep. Yeah. 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 I mean, so it, even all the way even to the, the end. the bulk bags too were that way. Yeah. And that gets to be really fun. Well, now we don't have that. No. You, you can say that, you can almost say that that's like adding a couple of tenths of an ounce of of water to that to that seed treatment just based on the kind yeah. of yeah well absolutely because i mean you're putting a lot less water you know you do we do put a little bit of that in there just to kind of get a good coating on the seed and yeah. we use definitely a lot less that way than we did in past yeah yep you got an right. awesome facility yeah i love it uh it's even just insulating it helps oh you know? boy yeah you know i mean it's and originally it wasn't going to be totally heated. We actually had an extra heat run or like put it in here. <laughs> yeah, it didn't, it didn't fit for where it was going to go. And I was like, Oh, twist my arm. Let's throw it in the seed side. <laughs> yeah. We just, we actually just got right over like the, the drive in the loading bay and stuff. And that's, that's enough to heat that whole, whole building. And that's yeah. radiant. It's radiant just radiant. Too. radiant too. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Was, if you've got good insulation in there, that's all you need. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's awesome. It's a good, uh, good setup we got here. It almost, uh, I almost want people to go through this the the old Rose Creek way just to appreciate this this more because you know for the guys that are doing yeah. it now we'll never appreciate the way that you know John and Jordan and I used to treat beans. Ashley used to treat beans out the oh, yeah. outside. Yeah, you think about <laughs> in shout April. Out to our, shout out to our old buddy John. Um, you think about how many beans were treated out of that facility. Oh, yeah. It was tens it was of nuts. thousands. Well, yeah. and and the method. You, yeah. you had to see the method, how it was done too. Cause it was just, you know, oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, dumping into, a, into a tender and then them tender into a box and then the tent and then the box onto a truck. And that is the best way to do it. It's the best way to do it. <laughs> but no, we're and set they up dry really nice. Good. They do. Yeah, yeah. We, and yeah. We're set up really nice now where we don't have, we don't, I don't really run into a sticking problem with anything. No. At all. I mean, I think it's, I, and that's part Great. of that formulation piece yeah. that, you know, the there's surfactants that go into that, into that formulation where there's no clumping. Right. I mean, it's uh, one of the things that's really, really bad to see is, you know, um, you'll see YouTube videos occasionally where a guy will have a tender and they're pulling beans out of that tender and it's, and it's like a, 
you know, a big oh, coagulated big, hunk big of that clump. seed will start sliding down. In, you Ro- know. in Rose Creek, we had a post, uh, a field sign post that we bent into a, a prod. That thing stayed in Rose Creek because we don't need it anymore. You know, and it's um, some of those generic, uh, the, some of those generic uh, seed, seed care offerings uh, from that are out there. You'll a hundred percent. Yeah. You see a lot of that. hundred percent. Yeah. And it's, well, it's pretty significant. That's part of the reason why we're paying, paying a good price for some of these products though, too. Cause I mean, that is, you know, the ease of use and, what and the margin and what you're getting, you know, yeah, you can, don't get me wrong. You can find some seed treatments that are on the cheap side and it's like, wow, I'm going to get a really good deal on this. Your stuff. witches brew. Like you yeah. were, or what's that? Was that what you were saying? I said well, that. You said yeah. the witches yeah. brew. But, yeah. but I mean, at the end of the day, um, you pay for what you get. And if you get half control, you know, and you get pythium that knocks you out, or you just have these ugly damn beans that look like they're barely treated. It's like, I paid three bucks for that or two bucks or that. I mean, you know, that, it goes that is back one of the, to the suckiest things out there goes back to the you know the customer that says hey don't care what you've got just just put something on it put it cheap and it just wants something cheap and we used to do a uh we used to do a a demo a demo where you know the red bean is a red is a red bean a red bean demo where you know basically i've got a couple of different kinds of candy in my case i always use sour cherry balls and uh atomic fireballs so they're both round, they're both red, they're both candy, they both have sugar, but there's a texture difference, there's a flavor difference, you know, there's a obvious hardness difference, but at the same time, it's, it's, it goes back to, you know, that customer that knows his disease spectrum on his acres and is planning for that disease spectrum. And in this case, you know, Pythium, uh, Fusarium virgiliform AAS, SDS, cyst nematode. Those are the three big pathogens across northern Iowa, southern Minnesota that that and were tailor made to cover those with Cruiser Max Apex and Saltro. So that's just a quick reminder. Don't go over to Perry's for Halloween because you're not gonna know what the <laughs> heck he's gonna have in that bucket. <laughs> he's got raisins he's got raisins yeah we'll take raisins or atomic fireballs or or cherry bombs uh, a red bean is a red bean. A red bean is a red bean uh any last closing thoughts you want to throw out there fuel to the fire i think uh Are you gonna roast us <laughs> guys you know it's and keep uh, we keep keep her keep her tame down here when, when you guys uh you you guys, I can't roast you. You've already roasted me by putting me on video. That, that's an ugly yeah, thing. Yeah, so that was. And, uh, <laughs> well, you got us to look at too. So. You know, and thanks. <laughs> I'm just going to say thanks a hell of a lot for this. Um, yeah, you so know. Perry Perry believes that we brought him here on false pretenses a little bit. We we talked to him about this a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, well, let's do a podcast. Yeah, and No problem. And then uh, we kind of pivoted a little bit and decided, well, let's put, let's video. put you on video too. <laughs> Oh, and we, we failed to mention that to him when he got in here and he's like oh god you too. <laughs> he saw the he saw the lights he saw the cameras he goes oh, yeah, oh i'm yeah, in yeah. trouble i'm in trouble no, uh, more no, like you two the, are in the, trouble the customer is in trouble for watching this <laughs> <laughs> well there's a podcast option <laughs> thank you guys for uh your support of syngenta seed care products and syngenta in general and thank you for having me and I appreciate the opportunity to come in and talk to your, to you guys and your customers about uh, Syngenta Seed Care. Perfect. Perfect. Thanks, I'll, Barry. I'll hit you guys with the outro then. Uh, pretty much anywhere, social media wise, uh, Nexus Co-op or Nexus Cooperative, you'll find us there. Uh, perfect. Uh, our YouTube page will feature our video version of this. So you can see Perry. And his uh, slides that he he brought today, and and so we his, appreciate uh, the video or the uh, Be graphics. Be careful what you ask for; you just might get it. <laughs> <laughs> um, subscribe to us there. Uh, follow the podcast. Uh, subscribe to the podcast. Um, so then you don't have to worry about it; it automatically downloads. Um, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook—it's uh, pretty much where you can find us. Uh, podcast wise, uh, Spotify, Amazon Music, uh, Apple Podcasts. Pretty much anywhere you get your podcast, iHeart. I know somebody had asked about that. 
Um, and then finally, we do have a player on our website, uh, nexus.coop forward slash podcast. So um, thank you guys again, Perry. Appreciate it, Chad. Thank you guys. Thank Appreciate you. It. Thanks, Perry. You bet. <laughs>